Hello and welcome back everyone. Happy Friday and happy two year anniversary of Victoria 3. Today we have received something that is very monumentous and I'm going to talk to you about what is probably the largest and most packed dev diary that we've ever received at any point in time ever. Um, this might be the literal longest dev diary and we are streaming uh, in as soon as we finish doing this so we only have one chance one opportunity to record this dev diary no repeated takes uh because we have to get everything right including mom's spaghetti we'll come back to mom's spaghetti uh one chance one opportunity etc etc but in addition to getting the biggest dev diary ever we also have the happiest week ever and i know you might be saying generalist i know exactly what you're talking about there's no need to explain um but we're gonna explain it anyways because we like doing it uh, we receive a happy Friday, which gives us not one, not two, but three happy days of the week. Truly, this is the happiest week of all time uh, because we received a dev diary on Tuesday with a happy uh, Tuesday, uh, a dev diary on Thursday with a happy Thursday. We missed a dev diary from Tinto Talks having, giving us a happy Wednesday. We thought, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. But then the dev diary on Thursday from the Victoria 3 team said, you know what, we're gonna pick up the slack. We're gonna give you a third dev diary this week just because Tinto dropped the ball. And this one, we're gonna wish you a happy Friday. And they did it, they pulled it off. Three happy days, three happy days, happy Friday. We would maybe restart and do a new take, but we don't have time to do a new take because we're gonna be doing a 12 hour stream Following this, if you're watching this, the 12 hour stream's probably already started for the anniversary of Victoria 3, which means we only get one take, one chance, one opportunity, mom's spaghetti, let's get into it. Happy Friday, and welcome to the third and final dev diary for the anniversary week. Before we get into the meat of the dev diary, and there's a lot of meat, you know what I mean? Uh, we have to, an infographic showing the progress of the free updates since release virtually shown in the lock, uh, look at the free updates at the start of the week, etc. We scuffed that one, uh, reading is hard. But here we have a whole bunch in free updates. We have Legitimacy Edition. I thought Legitimacy was always in the game, but it was just useless before 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, but we have Legitimacy Update here. Uh, we have the uh, Private Autonomous Investment, which was huge. A lot of people complained. In fact, this went even a step further in 1.7, where you could no longer uh, turn it off. Uh, we have 1.3 giving us agitators, character interactions, government petitions, and also, in addition to this, really, really uh, giving a lot more teeth to revolutions, which used to be just like an absolute joke before. Uh, we have in 1.4, uh, the game theme selector, Vancouver Island is now an island. Uh, 1.4 was really small. Uh, yeah, okay, we could just kind of... 1.4 was like a little speed bump on the way to 1.5, um, historically, or like in the time of Victoria 3. 1.5 was the massive patch. We got military formations, companies, uh, military visuals, and local prices. Uh, I, they dropped the ball here. They should have just said mappy and expected you to know what they meant. Um, uh, then we had 1.6, we got migration system rework, census data, uh, tabbed outliner, a really, really nice uh, kind of updates. Smaller update as well, 1.6 and 1.4 relatively small, and then 1.7. If they do not include it here, performance increase, I'm going to tear out my hair. Uh, building ownership provision, foreign investment, buildings panel, power blocks, lobbies, subject interaction, earning recognition. Ah, the biggest part of this update, you got, you, the performance got so much better, but okay. Fair enough. The entire, f uh, the entree, the entree talking about meat and spaghetti, is followed up with delightful spattering of statistics from the game. Uh, you can see the difference between how many uh, yellow pressures there have been since last time. Oh, yellow Prussia, gross. Uh, we see an anarchist little thing here. Uh, most countries played through. China, of course, everyone... Uh, People love one thing, and it's freaking Japan content. We have Japan, uh, Prussia, USA, Russia. We see the most common governments, presidential democracy, boo. Constitutional empire, uh, constitutional kingdom, shogunate, parliamentary democracy, woohoo. Parliamentary republic being, uh, of course, way better than presidential republic because you get to make more moves. That is money moves. Um, uh, that, uh, yeah, you just, it, it's just better because it's more flexible. Uh, we see Scandinavia formed. Um, okay. Uh, Anarchist Prussia formed. Ugh. Uh, Byzantium formed. Okay. Uh, I like trains. Me too. Um, but we get Trans-Siberian Railways and First Continental Railways, uh, created. Choo-choo, chugga-chugga. Uh, deeds not words uh, in terms of achievements. Is that the easiest achievement? Um, but Barbary's back, I think, is the rarest achievement. And it's... Is it a lot harder now? It's probably a lot harder now. We get companies formed, 23 million. Power blocks created, 1.3 million. We get uh, 
139,429,309 total hours played. And I can tell you, I can tell you with 100% confidence, we personally um, have accounted for over 36 of those hours. Uh, and then Barracks is built, we have around a billion. That's a lot. This is all for me, Community Manager Pelly. Thank you for not dropping the ball, Pelly, on the uh, Happy Friday. We would have cried ourselves to sleep tonight if you did. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed the Dev Diary from uh, Hansai and Victoria. That is the biggest and longest Dev Diary we've ever seen. You know, it's not the size of counts, it's the way you use it, but they use it pretty well too. And here we have kind of the first thing uh, that fills me with t uh, absolute terror. We get the India map rework. Now, uh, every time you see a region reworked, they get a lot more resources. I generally think this is cool. I generally think this is interesting. Uh, but we get some provinces uh, reworked as well here. And you can see uh, 1.6 to 1.8. You might notice something. There is a lot more, uh, you know, <laughs> a lot more countries here. Uh, we are going to be getting... Okay, so all the different countries of uh, the EIC and India tend to uh, contribute to something called front spaghetti. Uh, and what front spaghetti is when um, the fronts just blow up uh, and the armies have to shovel about in weird ways and it just kind of breaks the game. Uh, I'm pretty sure that adding a whole bunch of states and countries is just going to make this a lot worse. And so now fighting in India will be a nightmare. Uh, but to be fair, I think it was a nightmare before. And by before, I mean in the 1800s. So... Maybe, maybe this is actually immersive, but uh, let's get into it. Welcome, map aficionados, uh, those who love spaghetti, to this week's dev, uh, week's map bonanza. That's true. I'm uh, Lafonsi, I apologize if I pronounced your uh, name wrong, narrative designer and main map man on Victoria 3. Man, we love alliteration. Shout out to you. Uh, and I will be your host for this evening. As you might accept, Pivot of Empire's narrative content for India will be accompanied by relevant map rework, including new and reworked state regions, um, uh, cultures, and countries for the Indian subcontinent. We look to the right to double check that we were in fact recording. Uh, in addition to a miscellaneous other uh, exciting additions that will be detailed further down, um, as uh, always, we've gotten some ground to cover. Boy, do we. So without wasting more of your time, let's get into it. We have... Uh, kind of, uh, this could maybe summarize what's going on, uh, but we have, uh, you know, all of this, the Kali Sia Raj, we see more states, uh, more countries, uh, and this is terrifying to me. I am filled with terror uh, at a constant basis. We see South Asia. If you find yourself thinking that India has too many tags already, I do. Uh, this update may not be the one for you. Oh no. Uh, to help illustrate the immense complexity of 19th century India for Pivot of Empire, we have added 30 new tags uh, to the 1836 start date, which is also going to make uh, co world conquest a little harder, though it's unbelievably easy right now. Uh, as well as multiple new formables and releasables uh, that these nations can aspire towards. That is always cool. We do love formables and releasables. Really wish you guys held another vote for adding formables and releasables. Uh, that way we could have fixed the timeline and made Neo Carthage. Um, but that's a separate discussion. All with distinct identities and flags. Uh, former abstractions like Arissa and uh, Budelkin land. Uh, apologies for this mispronunciation and all the future mispronunciations uh, have been replaced with new new princely states and in Gujarat, Baroda and uh, now simply the most important Gujarati state instead is now the only one. The fan favorites of uh, Garhwal and uh, Manipur have made their debut along with the, a few other states and nations ranging from the decentralized tribes along the assam Burma nor uh, border in the northeast to the British crown colony of Ceylon and the Sultanate of Maldives in the southwest. So we are getting a whole bunch of new stuff um in the and this is map stuff in the northwest the sikh empire is now uh uh, known as the Kali Saraj, and faces a somewhat different position compared to previous patches. In addition to grappling with the internal intrigues uh, of the Lahore court, uh, notably uh, no historically a source of weakness for the empire during its struggle against the British, it must now all contend with new powerful vassal, uh, the ambitious uh, Gulab Singh of Jammu, who finds himself in uh, 1836 preoccupied with suppressing a revolt in the newly conquered region of Ladakh. Okay. Um, this all makes sense. And we do see, uh, oh man, there's so many more princely states. Look at all this. Look at all these new states. Other exciting additions. So this one was, uh, exciting is a word for it, right? When we're absolutely terrified, you know, when Jason's running at us with a, a machete, we are excited in some sense. When we drink too many of these and we have heart palpitations, in some sense we are excited, yes. Um, but, um, fear, terror, okay. 
other exciting additions include uh, the rump state of uh, Satara, uh, led by the last uh, Shatap uh, Pati uh, of the Maratha. I'm struggling here with the pronunciations. And the once mighty Mughal Empire. Woohoo! Now reduced to the confines of the city of Delhi. Aww. Um, although the, after the Mughals controlling more than their own palace grounds isn't historically accurate, their newfound autonomy allows them to serve as a vehicle for narrative content. Our favorite. And so we see a little bit of a comparison here where um, it looks like, are these the absolute states? Okay, so these are the states getting reworked, which is going to be a, a pretty big difference uh, in terms of, right, these are state states. Um, uh, they're going to be split up and carved up and spaghettied up, uh, but this is going to make a big difference in terms of which states are the best, I assume, because um, uh, Delhi and... Uh, Delhi's been carved up. Delhi was previously one of the very best states, and same with North Bengal was previously one of the best states, and so I assume that things might have changed a little bit. And the estate regions have also been reworked and redrawn where deemed appropriate. We've tried to strike a balance between administrative borders fitting uh, for the 19th century and cultural borders better reflecting the ethno-linguistic makeup of the subcontinent, all while trying to not divide the map into too many unwieldy state regions for gameplay purposes. That's right. Uh, petition to merge all of uh, <coughs> New England, like everything north of uh, New York into one single state, New England, uh, to merge, uh, of course, uh, Wyoming, Montana, and the Dakotas into one state labeled at all. And of course, the monstrous, uh, you know, uh, proposition that we also merge Texas and California um, to Texafornia. Uh, no one ever supports that one, but we support it. Um, all for the sake of performance. This is for the USA. Oh, and I forgot the most important, D.C. and Maryland. D.C. and Maryland actually just should be merged. It's, like, impossible to do anything with D.C. because it only is one arable land. Uh, notable changes include the new east-west split for Bengal, mirroring a similar division in Punjab, alongside uh, the addition of new state regions such as the ceded districts of Arakan, and a reshaping of redefinition of most pre-existing states. So we see um, also... Wait, what is this? This must be culture. Uh, we people of culture. We have also uh, added a selection of new cultures to India to showcase a, the extraordinary diversity of the subcontinent, such as Hindustani, uh, Shaga, Rita, uh, I can't pronounce that, uh, Naga, uh, Dakani, uh, Pathan, Lushi, and so much more. If you're from India and, uh, you know, my, my word is like, my words of mispronunciation are like a cheese grater on your ears. I apologize sincerely. Um, and we see uh, some of the map stuff. British India Company. Uh, in a similar vein, uh, India's hub and spine system has been reworked from the ground up, which uh, has seen the elimination of a lot of anachronisms and misplaced subs. So the valiant uh, forum members that have championed the good cause of uh, Jam Shedapur for years now, you can rest easy knowing that we can finally fix its location. We don't know the location of anything in India personally. Uh, well, not anything, but like most things in India. So um, I, this is not something I could comment on too much. Uh, and that should uh, not be enough because, well, good news with Victoria, uh, 8, uh, Victoria 3 and 1.8, we have dynamic renaming. So we can see, I'm guessing this is going to be Constant Yi and uh, Constantinopolis. Uh, which is, uh, you know, when Greece uh, kind of controls it. But there's no flag. Should have moved the capital over here, my guys. Uh, that's right, it's finally here. And uh, what a version you will get. Most cur current dynamic renaming in game is decided by the owner's cultures, the above being Turkish and Greek, but there are also exceptions to this. For example, moving your capital to, uh, to Edo, as Japan will now rename the city to Tokyo, and the city of Bismarck, North Dakota, will be named Edwinton until the Iron Chancellor has actually made a name for himself. Are you telling me that the people of North Dakota are not prophets. Also, disappointing, this implies that there is no at all state. Uh, it is sad we need to sign this petition. Okay, uh, we will see. We could go. Oh, can we customize names? No. Now I have to. Okay, this is a good thing. Uh, but this also means. Uh, this also means. Uh, when we are streaming multiplayer games, we are going to have to. Now keep an eye out for see people making racist names uh, in their capital states and this type of stuff. Ah. Damn, damn, damn. Okay, fair enough. Um, we're streaming a multiplayer game and someone uh, changes the capital city of their name to uh, Carthage should have lost and we don't boot them from the game. Um, it's, it's not good. 
And should none of the picks we've made be to your liking, fear not, for Hub and State Names now fully customizable in game. Of course, we fully expect you to be sensible and measured in your application of this newfound power. No one is going to be sensible and measured. It will be chaos. Chaos, I tell you. Uh, but okay. Uh, for modders, uh, it goes without saying this is an incredibly flexible system, and we hope you will have a lot of fun with it going forward. That's right. That means we can um, make... Oh, we forget the name. Rings of Power. The thing, the name of the place before it was Mordor. You can make it so that when Sauron gives it, it turns into Mordor. Yeah, yeah. We need to lower the rings mod, please. We need to show that the orcs are not as bad as they say because they're industrious and the other the other races are not. Um, clearly Tolkien did not have an anti-industrial ambition. But now we have narrative content. Hello, this is Victoria, narrative design leader of Victoria 3. Um, and we know this because the game's named after you. Uh, but thank you. Hi, Victoria. Who will never see this? And today I will be covering the free narrative content and political setup changes that are coming in uh, Update 1.8. The paid content that will be coming in Pivot Empire will be covered in a later dev diary. Could have made it a quadruple happy week. Could have just like just been like, we're going to put it all in this week. Um, but you know what? To be fair, they kind of already said, we're going to put it all in this dev diary uh, that we are have to go through immediately preceding our 12-hour stream. So it's kind of like a 14-hour stream because this is going to take us over an hour. Um, shout out to you guys. We're 16 minutes in. Actually, we're kind of flying, but, you know, let's, let's, let's keep going. Uh, Indian political setup. Upon at beginning the game as the East India Company, one may notice uh, that the interest groups must be, uh, one must contend with are not those that they have been accustomed to. That's right, new interest groups. The EIC has been given a full uh, suite of custom interest groups uh, designed to accurately represent the unique situation the, that it finds itself in. We haven't read through these yet because when we were skipping through, we were on our phone and we didn't open any of the images, but this is going to be neat. Uh, the most notable of these uh, new interest groups is the East India Company interest group representing the European colonial interest in India. Woo unless you're from India, in which case, boo. Uh, or actually, unless you like human rights. Yeah. Uh, it, it has received a set of all new ideologies and traits for this purpose, transformed itself into a representation of an ideology, mindset, and interest of the British colonial administration, boo. Uh, upon the establishment of the British Raj, it will be named the government of India, uh, the truth hurts, uh, but it's the Indi ideology will stay essentially the same. So we see in here, the British East India Company, notably, uh, the... Notably, we previously, when you play the EIC, it just feels like an absolute struggle because you're either like really, really underneath the landowners or the rural folk uh, if you go homesteading. Uh, but now they've been renamed the Zamindadar, uh, as Dars. Uh, uh, I, we're not going to pronounce all these, but you can see here all of these, all of these have unique names. Um, so this is very exciting. We see the. No, oh, we can't zoom very well. Um, okay, so we see the East India Company, um, which has, uh, let's see, stamped and signed, responsible government, and wounded honor. Wounded honor gives minus authority and uh, additional mortality per turmoil. We don't like that. Uh, stamped and signed gives bureaucracy rather than tech spread. I think that bureaucracy rather than tech spread is an interesting one. I think that that's probably worse. And then we see enactment time and qualifications, which is definitely worse than investment pool. But uh, the investment pool is significantly nerfed um, in uh, for us here in uh, India, which is uh, a substantive thing. Uh, we're going to get to that a little bit more. We see that they uh, support an extraction economy and then uh, agrarianism and industry banned. Uh, secondarily, so you will not be able to use your industrialists uh, to help you get laissez-faire because they actually oppose laissez-faire here, um, which is fascinating. And so this is going to make your time playing the EIC a, a bit of a struggle. I wonder if this will, if you form India, if this will go away um, with all these like ideologies. But this is the colonialist ideology here. Um, we see it, they like colonial exploitation, naturally. Uh, commercial agriculture... Um, which makes sense. Um, they strongly endorse oligarchy and autocracy. Um, they national supremacy, racial segregation, uh, militarized police force, uh, appointed bureaucrats. Uh, all this, uh, they strongly endorse the caste system of forced uh, per capita taxation, land based taxation. Uh, that is a bit of a time, but getting onto proportional taxation, yeah, might be a bit harder with them. No migration controls. 
uh, private schools, uh, public health care, kind of some normalish stuff for industrialists, uh, but very, very key difference is that they do not support the laissez-faire and protectionism. They are full-on colonialist. Um, the new colonialist ideology has implemented in various places, both new and old, um, with the East India Company as the only as only one example. Uh, it uh, is also used to make the industrialist and colonial administration support resource extraction rather than independent economic development. Um, expecting to see this in the Dutch East Indies, their instrument in doing this is the new extraction economy law, which increases the efficiency of agriculture and resource industries while crippling the investment pool. Uh, not just while, but whilst. Man, we love the way Victoria writes. Uh, most notably, extraction economy. Shout out to Victoria. Extraction economy harms the, uh, the native uh, land uh, landowning classes' ability to reinvest, representing the historic effects of the British Indian uh, land ownership structure. The Zam Mindari system of land ownership was uh, predicated upon predicated. We love it upon the uh, use of Indian landowners as tax collection agents for the British administration, under the expectation that the landowners could use that revenue uh, for internal improvements. In reality, very few internal improvements were actually made, and the, and the Indian agricultural system remained largely stagnant. Landowners' estates were constantly partitioned, with large chunks being sold at auction in order to make shortfalls for the tax collection. Woo uh, and we see extraction economy economic system, which looks bad, but then you think for a second... Okay, our subjects don't use the investment pool anyway, right? Uh, in a general sense. So if you could actually impose this on your subjects, um, which should be difficult, but if you could do it uh, somewhat consistently... Uh, this will be actually extremely good because they don't actually use up all their investment pool anyways. Uh, and this makes it so that when you have something that is building in their country, whether it's agriculture extractions or plantations, um, then you will be getting uh, a whole lot more. Um, nationalization investment return. Um, is that what exactly does that apply to? Nationalization investment return. I forget exactly what that modifier applies to. Uh, when when you nationalize the building, who who exactly is getting more money from that happening? I'm guessing that's what that is. Um, but if you can impose this on your subjects uh, pretty aggressively, uh, this will represent for you, um, when your auto queue builds in your subjects, it will represent much more efficient industries, or 10% more efficient. I don't know if that's much, but uh, whilst the Zim, uh, now you're just showing off. Uh, whilst the Zemindari system was not only the only system of land ownership uh, put in place by the British administration, it was the dominant form in the Bengal presidency, and thus the most economically impactful. The other major land ownership was the Rayotori system, in which taxes were collected directly from individual peasants, is representing by the persistent modifiers on southern Indian states, which permit for greater uh, self-ownership of agricultural buildings in these states. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay. Uh, land ownership uh, set up allows for peasants in southern India to receive dividends from their plots, marginally increasing their quality of life. Okay, okay, okay. That's neat. In order to represent the power structure of colonial India, uh, British India will have two mo uh, one of two modifiers depending on whether the company or crown is in command. These modifiers greatly uh, increase the political strength of bureaucrats and depress the influence of air Indian aristocracy, as well as making it nigh impossible to create a legitimate government without designated ruling IG in command. British India also has a custom rule for selecting its government. The leader of the industrials will necessarily become the next ruler upon the death or removal of the previous one. That is uh, definitely going to be interesting and neat to uh, kind of play with. Uh, and all of this is shaping up to be like an enormous amount of flavor for the EIC, where the EIC actually might be the country that feels the most different from other countries to play as. Uh, when it comes to the political system, uh, as a result of all of the changes that we put in, uh, which is really going to be a breath of fresh air, uh, and I think they're doing it while maintaining kind of their de design philosophy, well, th to some degree, of we want the game to be as sandboxy as possible, we don't want to give individual modifiers to countries. Now, to be fair, having unique interest groups, unique interest group bonuses, these are individual bonuses. They're just not bonuses in the terms of like you get five percent throughput on furniture, but they're still they're still individual bonuses. Uh, like France getting the construction bonus is still insane. Uh, but I I think about this. Um, I I think that they're doing it. They're kind of walking a tight line 
behind the between the design philosophy and the fact that the design philosophy is at odds in my opinion to some extent um with like replayability um uh and uh like unique flavor this this definitely seems like a hyper flavorful uh, update here uh we see um plus 200 percent industrial's political strength under um company rule which makes a lot of sense because you won't have a lot of capitalists there um or people who naturally want to join this uh, uh interest group and so this is one way to give them a lot of power minus 50 legitimacy ugh. um plus 65 legitimacy from including the head of state and government so you gotta have them in an extra political strength for bureaucrats capitalists and officers uh, minus the, uh, that for aristocrats so we will actually have uh, powerful industrialists and then we see crown rule once it becomes the raj um, kind of giving a much more political strength to the bureaucrats here which are going to be probably the group that is joining most um or other than the capitalists um the industrialists and so uh this will be interesting i wonder if these will be the final numbers but um we can kind of get the idea here uh with the industrialists uh transformed into a colonial bureaucratic nightmare uh slash hellscape we of course uh we needed to add some sauce to that spaghetti um not only, not only will the fronts be a nightmare, but the colonial administration will also be a nightmare, truly capturing the, ep the essence of colonial extraction. Um, uh, who will advocate for the economically uh, modernizing India? Uh, uh, whilst you did it again, uh, the in East India Company represents the European uh, colonial interests. The economic interests of the uh, native Indi Indian bourgeoisie are represented by the can't pronounce this interest group uh, the can't pronounce this is a bengali term which translates to gentlemen uh and is represented the moneyed upper class which essentially rose to prominence through collaborations with the eic during their conquests in india uh whilst the now we're just showing off uh whilst the majority of uh european capitalists gravitate towards the eic uh indian capitalists will join the can't pronounce instead uh, once it achieves independence, of course, India's industrials will return to their normal rule as an Indian industrial upper class, and the can't pronounce will once more uh, represent the, exclusively the petite bourgeoisie. Uh, the can't pronounce start with two ideologies that differ from standard petite bourgeoisie, uh, sovereignist and modernizer, and this is really exciting because we have someone that supports multiculturalism if we had like a party popper where we could go pop and it would be like and then like air horns we would put them in right here fans of the colossus of the south may note that modernizer is the brazilian pb past a certain point uh it has been used and it expanded uh to the pb across the indian subcontinent is used for the brazilian pb past a certain point really okay well here's the thing um here's the thing that we're looking at sovereignist here endorse multiculturalism now multiculturalism with the racism rework shout out to racism is probably not going to be um, as important as it was previously uh but we do have someone who supports multiculturalism which we're of course a big fan of uh they support protected speech migration controls uh um boo to the no migration controls uh local police uh interventionism uh, but they're neutral towards laissez-faire. So if you're on any of these systems above this, they will support you going to laissez-faire. Uh, compulsory primary school, which is nice, and protectionism. But also free trade, if you're on mercantilism or isolationism, uh, is supported relative to those. Uh, the sovereignist ideology replaces the patriotic, making the Indian PB support a lessening of discrimination and restrictions upon political expression. If India is to, is to achieve independence, however, the ideology will immediately switch back to the default patriotic. So that means you got to get the multiculturalism in while the uh, while the striking is hot. The can't pronounce it will not support a discriminatory British police state, uh, but this does not mean that they will oppose discriminatory Indian or wait. They will not support a discriminatory uh, British police state, but this does not mean they oppose a discriminatory Ita Indian police state. <laughs> Shout out to discrimination. We don't like your discrimination. We like our discrimination. Please, 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 please. Uh, you know, let's show you. Let us show you how it's done. Um, this ideology is switching. Uh, uh, this ideology switching is used uh, throughout India content, as with the new uh, minor minoritarian traditionalist ideology but um ideology switching or being able to switch i don't think this currently in game hopefully they make it so if you swap religions uh this will also swap 
which now people are going to be trying to figure out ways to swap Jewish because Jewish is the best religion in Victoria 3. Um, glad we put that like at the end of it in Victoria 3. It is the best religion. Uh, I'm not going to make... I think there is no best religion IRL, but it, it is the best in Victoria 3. Uh, so uh, we're going to see maybe, 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 maybe if you religion swap, because you can convert now, I think, or you could have movements to convert. Um, I think we saw that in an earlier Death Dire. It'll be exciting if we could see that. And also, huge, huge, huge for modding. Um, this 1.8... Uh, adding stuff like ideology switching as well as all the other stuff we covered uh, the other day, 1.8 might just be the biggest one for modding, the biggest uh, patch for modding by like a huge margin. Um, and I'm super excited to see what people make with it. Um, and, um, you know, what are you guys going to be, modders out there, what are you guys going to be making with it and why is it a Lord of the Rings mod? Okay. We see the Minoritarian min Minoritarian traditionalists words are hard um where they endorse legal guardianship total separation interesting caste system enforced all right hypocrisy mechanics i'm pleased to introduce something that's been missing <laughs> uh the traditionalist ideology prevents the leaders from supporting state religion if the country's state religion does not match their personal origin woohoo uh, if the country's religion ever switches to their personal religion however they will stop supporting secularism and immediately begin supporting state religion hey this sounds like everyone ever uh these ideology switches are handled in uh on on actions as well as various cases throughout the narrative content a big reason why the united states is secularist is because a lot of the people coming to the united states um were uh, coming because of religious persecution, because they wanted to be Protestant and they were fleeing places that were uh, Catholic, or they wanted to be their own brand of Protestantism, and they were freeing the Church of England, or they were fleeing the Church of England, uh, and so they came here uh, suffering under religious persecution, and so they were like, they were of the opinion, you know what, people should be able to worship whatever they want, and now there are a lot of people in the United States who are like. And this is not a political commentary, but there are a lot of people in the United States who are like, hey, this is a state of, you know, uh, Christian values. We should have, you know, uh, it should be united and we should be like a religious nut country uh, and this type of thing. And they uh, are not fans of the church and state thing because they want the values and laws to be in line with their own particular religion um, because they, they, they've... They're beyond what the Founding Fathers came here from, uh, which is uh, religious persecution, and they haven't been receiving it. Uh, and so now they're like, you know what? State religion sounds like a great idea. Just our religion. Woohoo. Uh, and then you get uh, a religious state. Okay. Um, shout out to... Oh, I forget the word for it. I forget the word for a religious state. Theocracy. There we go. Bam. Shout out to theocracies. There, while there are many other changes, we'll fix that in post, except we won't. Uh, there are many other changes to pop attraction, values, and traits, uh, but to go over the changes uh, to every interest group in the depth would unfortunately put me over the, uh, po uh, the per post image limit. Bro, you guys are already over the limit. Uh, and if you go any more over the limit, I'm going to have to be... Oh, I'm going to have to go over the limit as well, except a different limit. I won't be able to drive, is what I'm saying. Um, but... Uh, we do see cast not in force here. Um, finally, here's the new East India law setup at start. Um, so we see oligarchy, cultural exclusion. All this looks kind of normal, except we see the extraction economy kind of being the big one. Uh, migration controls, debt slavery. Uh, yep, we get debt slavery. I'm waiting for... I, I For the longest time, I've been wanting them to allow debt slavery and multiculturalism simultaneously for the, like libertarian hellscape slash paradise um but it's currently not allowed in the game mechanics uh whilst the eic okay that's that's one too many we've had enough this is you're, no more driving for you uh the eic possesses the oligarchy in the case uh cast not enforced laws uh the institution of the british raj following the indian uprising will lead to the enactment of autocracy and caste system codified this represents the centralization of power in the raj and the effort made by the colonial administration in the 1860s to codify the indian caste system into the modern uh, nationwide Varna system. We have flavor for flavor flavor for the Indian uprising. Look at all this. That's so many options. 
Um, okay. Uh, in the year 1857, the years of mismanagement, that's like right after game start, the years of mismanagement by the, or actually it's 20 years, uh, by the British East India Company spiraled into an uprising which briefly rendered a third of the Indian subcontinent ungovernable. Uh, the uprising has been referred to as the Sepoy Mutiny by various British sources and the various names from the First uh, War of Independence uh, to the Great Rebellion to, uh, by Indian writers. For the remainder of this dev diary, I will refer to it as the Indian Uprising. That seems nice and neutral. Uh, the Indian Uprising was previously represented in the Avert Mutiny Journal's entry setup, uh, which would spawn the Mughal Empire as a revolt if the EIC failed to complete the journal entries. It, uh, in 1.8, this journal entry has been completely reworked. Woohoo! We, where we are getting the Unstable Raj with nice progress bars, which are cool. Um, uh, the new Unstable Raj uh, journal entry is available. Upon game start for the East India Company, all princely states will have a more concise version of this journal entry for the purpose of tracking the levels of unrest of the EIC. The stability of each presidency within the East India Company is tracked with its own progress bar, which will increase or decrease based on various conditions. These conditions include taxation, or the liberty desire of the princely states within a given region, uh, the presence of utilita uh, utilitarian administrators, more on this in future devdari, and more utilitarian administrators. Uh, shout out to the doctor. There's a, there's a utilitarian joke. Uh, you go to a doctor. Um, and this is philosophical utilitarianism, so it might not apply here. You go to the doctor, uh, and you're like, Doctor, I don't know what's wrong with you. Uh, or, I don't know what's wrong with me. Well, you're about to find out, actually. Uh, I don't know what's wrong with me. And the doctor does a full checkup, and the doctor says, I have good news and bad news. You're perfectly healthy. Uh, and uh, if you've never taken a philosophy class, that joke shouldn't make sense to you. But if you've taken one, or as I'm about to explain the joke now, because jokes always are funnier when you explain them, um, utilitarians... Greatest good for the greatest number of people. If you're perfectly healthy, then one of the counter arguments to utilitarianism is they believe that a perfectly healthy person, you could kill them and harvest their organs and save like a half dozen people who are not perfectly healthy, and that would lead to more of the greater good or more people surviving, and so you should do that. And so when the doctor says you're perfectly healthy, what they mean to say is you're perfectly healthy and we're going to kill you and harvest your organs because I'm a utilitarian, which is why you walked in and ruined the joke by saying, hey doctor, I don't know what's wrong with you because that doctor is insane okay uh shout out to utilitarianism but we're gonna get more of that in a future dev diary okay turmoil and more um this of course uh the the progress bar journal entries that encourage or discourage normal gameplay patterns like massive taxation um are always kind of really cool because they force you to play it a little bit of a different way and so uh, if we see this forcing us to play it a different way, this will, of course, make us have to think about how to play it differently, which um, makes it, or think differently if you're from Apple, um, this is going to make it so that we are going to be uh, having different gameplay patterns of this type of thing. Man, we gotta, we gotta hurry it up. Uh, what is the presidency? Historically, they were the highest level administration, uh, administrative units in, in colonial India. In game, their borders are determined by the various Indian strategic regions. The presidency concept uh, details uh, details precisely which regions equate with which presidency. Wait, what? Or presidency? Is that presidency, not presidency? Okay, uh, these precedencies are the highest level of administration, strategic region. Uh, we see a bunch of these. Oh, okay, so we are going to have new strategic regions, right? Borders delimited by strategic regions. Fantastic. So now it's not just going to be two strategic regions for the entirety of India. Uh, very, very cool. A major event change which uh, will affect the stability of the precedencies deals with these... Uh, it deals with cartridges issued to, to, to Indian sepoys. After researching rifling, a rumor will begin to spread throughout the ranks of the company's soldiers about the nature of the cartridge grease. If mismanaged, this event could lead to a sharp decrease in the stability of the precedencies. Okay. Interesting. That sounds like a bit of history I have no idea about. Um, if the stability of any precedency drops too low over a given period, or if 25 years elapse without completing the consolidated colonial rule journal entry and raising the standard of living India to the requisite level, uh, India will explode into rebellion. Um, okay, so we have a consolidated colonial rule. 
Um, the precise character of this rebellion depends upon which regions are most affected with the national unrest as well as the liberty desire of the various princely states. If unrest is concentrated in Bengal presidency, the main drama of the rebellion will revolve around Delhi, uh, Delhi uh, and the bid of the mutinying sepoys to restore the Mughal Empire. Each presidency possesses a major revolter, Mughals in Bengal, uh, Satara and uh, Shatapati, uh, of the Maratha Company Confederacy in Bombay and the rebellious uh, princely state of uh, Kurnool in Madras. Once again, full apologies for mispronouncing every single one of those words except for rebellion. We, we hit that one on the head. Um, with all of these factors, the Indian uprising uh, can possess endless permutations from something similar to the bonds of the historic uprising, which we see here, uh, to something a little bit more like this, distributed across multiple regions and companies of various pr uh, princely states, to an apocalyptic front spaghetti vomit on your spaghetti already you didn't even eat the spaghetti you just threw up on it what did you throw up you threw up your sweater on mom's spaghetti this is the apocalyptic british uh, authority uh, british authority across the subcontinent we're saying no to the british categorically speaking and we vomited on our spaghetti already uh, i imagine can we see front spaghetti right now how many fronts is this going to be my guys how many fronts is this going to be if these are all different wars, different mutinies that you have to contend with. That's more fronts than the British has armies. <clears throat> and British has a lot of armies. If a princely state possesses a high liberty desire when the uprising breaks out, um, it will get an opportunity to either join the Matharas or the Mughals or try and forge its own path. Pledgling fealty to either the Mughals or Matharas will make a princely state a sort of vassal of the emperor or chat uh chat yeah um we see indian flames um once this uh shape of the uprising has been determined then we determine the yaw um a uh, war will break out between a coalition uh, of revolters and the british in order to preserve itself the east india company must put down every revolter in order to restore india or rest restore their order to india wow yeah, that's a different thing than restoring India, isn't it? Uh, we see the mutiny, <coughs> and all these have to not exist. Uh, and if completed, Britain gets the jewel in the crown. And other than that, they get the final blow. And not the good kind. Uh, if, the, if the British win, as they did historically, the British government will set uh, step in and reform the administration to India to ensure this does not happen again. Uh, the East India Company will be reorganized, reorganized in the British Raj, and most of its autonomy will be stripped from it. We hate that when that, hap when that happens. However, what if the Indian uprising is triumphant and the British are driven out of the subcontinent? We get the final blow. Uh, India's lost. Let Whitehall squabble over the remaining assets. Big sad for uh, the... Man, I love this art. This art is freaking sweet. Um, but okay. Um, we will get an event. After losing to the revolters, uh, the East India Company will retreat into one of three precedencies, abandoning its holding uh, in all other regions. Alternatively, it may abandon India completely. Some of these outcomes for this event are below. Okay. So we see what happens when they implode. Okay, once the British are gone or reduced to a rump state hanging on to whatever they could against uh, hold against the revolt, the Indian subcontenders may shift to managing their newly acquired empires. This looks like something that we have a problem with. British, Scottish, India, Irish. Wait. We don't have a problem with the British, Scottish, Irish. We have a problem with um, <laughs> modding. I don't, I don't do the modding stuff. Astute observers may be able to notice in the screenshot above, the leaders of the EIC, the president armies are European, while the leaders of every other interest group are Indian. And this is going to be an important one. Prior to 1.8, interest groups were only able to select leaders of primary cultures. This is no longer the case. Which implies to me, maybe we can invite agitators of other cultures, which is a huge thing. Um, being able to invite agitators uh, of other cultures, and maybe you won't be able to, really opens stuff up for people that are not European. Uh, this is no longer the case. Interest groups can now be assigned uh, priority cultures, uh, which will force characters of the interest group to have certain cultures given a certain set of conditions. So, uh, this is why you had interest group leaders that were not English, which is the primary culture of the EIC at GameStart. This has enabled us to flavor the East India Company, industrialists and presidency armies, uh, uh, armed forces, interest groups as European, whilst yeah, the other interest groups uh, represent various classes amongst the native Indian population. We have 
new subject tracks, and this one is going to be a big deal because this is for the metagame players because I think what this will do, I think this will prevent you from making India implode um, uh, by uh, declaring war on a subject of uh, India or of the EIC while being on the same side of a war as Great Britain. Because now they're called, uh, now they're going to be a chartered company, uh, which I think is going to prevent the implosion, which is going to dramatically affect what is the optimized run metagame. 1.8, two new subject types have been added, and existing ones have been reconfigured into three separate tracks. Dominions now belong to a different track than puppets, and all tracks have uh, two steps. So we no longer have three-step protectorate, dominion, a puppet, and then annex. Um, which means you can annex people faster if you subjugate them. Rather than needing to promote from a puppet uh, to a dominion to a protectorate, puppets now promote directly to protectorates. I, of course, assume that uh, she meant the reverse. Protectorates now promote directly to puppets because we are not... <laughs> We're not playing as the subject. We're doing the subjugating. Um, uh, and so <laughs> we promote them before we annex them, before we promote them to being part of the greatest sovereign state of all time. Uh, chartered companies are the new subject type, which possess all the autonomy of a protectorate, which doesn't need to be defended by their overlord, unlike the EIC, in order for them to remain a subject, uh, whilst paying a higher share of their income to their overlord. So they're a protectorate that pays the ducats. Um, and so what this means is, uh, if the UK doesn't defend them, they won't automatically become, um, or this is what I think this means, they won't automatically become uh, uh, liberated or free, uh, which means that you can't just automatically make them implode uh, by creating a war situation, uh, a certain particular war situation that really shouldn't be allowed, but... Um, uh, this is an interesting thing for all you metagamers out there. Examples of chartered companies include the Hudson Bay Company, East India Company, Russian American Company, and chartered companies which may be established through African colonial administrations. Which, by the way, the extraction, um, the extraction economic type actually might make these viable now. Uh, whereas previously they have not been viable whatsoever. Uh, we see all these different subject types. We see colony, kind of one of the new ones, um, where... Uh, what is this all doing? I don't know what all these symbols mean. What does it all mean? This is how much money they're contributing to you, and this is how many convoys. Uh, but I don't know what this means. Uh, is this part of market? Or is this, um, hmm, is this uh, that they have to join wars? Okay. And this is how their level of autonomy are locked in they are, I think. But um, we see the chartered company is paying 40% of their income, which is the most. Uh, which is very interesting, and the colony is also paying a lot of their income. Uh, fascinating. In terms of narrative, uh, dominions and colonies represent colonial governments of various types, whilst protectorates and puppets represent the uh, native-ruled states that are nonetheless lack political autonomy. Tributaries and vassals have been remained unchanged. Um, colonies can now have subjects of their own, which means the princely states uh, stay safely connected to the Raj. Also visible here... Uh, ooh. Okay. Uh, notably, the creation of a whole bunch of new tags does make it so that there's way more countries in the British, um, uh, what is it, um, power block, which has implications. Uh, since they're not directly their subjects, oh, are they directly the subjects? Or this is the British Raj. Uh, if the British Raj were able to form their own power block, that would be, a, that would be some mandate generation, huh? Uh, but what this represents for the British Raj is an enormous amount of authority because they have the vassalization principle. Uh, and so, because there's way more countries now. So this also affects, uh, to some extreme, or to some degree, um, metagame. Uh, we have the corporate states, um, which is a new governance principle, which is uh, fascinating. It also unlocks cooperative ownership as the economic system. It's going to be interesting to see who supports this. Um, uh, but uh, this is like a petite bourgeoisie uh, version of um, Council Republic, by the looks of it. Um, that also gives authority. I don't think Council Republic gives authority. Which might make this pretty good, especially if you actually have a good particular PB. Um, but... Uh, uh, 1.8 are largely centered around the British East India Company, a massive corporation that acts as a state. We've also added corporate uh, state law. These two things are completely unrelated. 
Corporate state is a new government's principal law added in 1.8 to represent states such as the federal state of Austria, uh, uh, Fayum, the Italian Social Republic, of, uh, and Ireland, as well as uh, various end goals of various 19th century and early 20th century political movements. The corporate state law focuses around an industrialized collaborative uh, class collaboration as a basis of the state uh, in this conception of society different classes and professions can be likened to vital organs within a single body all serving different uh, different yet uh, equally important functions dun dun two separate yet equally important oh, yeah okay enough law and order uh, corporate state uh, is primarily supported by the corporatists and the fascists uh, it also serves as a midpoint for various ideologies being uh, more favored than their least favorite government principle, but inferior to their preferred government principles. So, um, it, it acting as a midpoint means that you can pass something that's really one way and then come back to it and do this to pass it easier, which is going to make uh, it probably easier to get on cooperative ownership through this track rather than council republic. Uh, would be my guess, but maybe not. The enactment of corporate state serves as an endgame to a fascist playthrough, much as Council Republic serves as an endgame to the communist playthrough. Um, although, currently, cooperative ownership is actually not very good, so, um, because you lose all your stuff in subjects. Well, uh, whilst, there's too many, uh, enacting a uh, corporate state, one must choose uh, which interest groups it uh, that is corporate structure will benefit, uh, permanently improving the clout of the player's choice of interest group as long as the law is active. Interesting. Um, so we can favor the trade unions, the industrials, or the intelligentsia. This level of being able to choose is actually probably particularly good, huh? Um, because uh, once you kind of figure out how clout's going to be balanced, um, you ideally, ideally, uh, when you do this, you're probably going to want to try and create four interest groups or more, but more is really hard, that are powerful and happy at the same time between um, the petit bourgeoisie, the trade unions, and the industrialists, uh, and the intelligentsia. Uh, have them over 20% clout or staying over 18% clout so you can get their doubled bonus on all of these uh, because they all have pretty good bonuses. Um, even the petite bourgeoisie has good bonuses, but they're kind of hard to keep happy. But maybe they're not hard to keep ha happy with the corporatist thing, and maybe the corporatist thing is uh, satisfying enough for the industrialists because it's not communism uh, that this actually maybe is going to be particularly good to just go corporatist for the political reasons. Um, uh, which, you know, this is how fascism gets in, boys. Uh, in order to represent the historical fondness uh, uh, that certain stains of fascism have for possessed for state-supervised workers, cooperatives, the corporate state enables the cooperative ownership law. Uh, enables? Or allows it? Enacting corporate, uh, cooperative ownership under a corporate state will empower the petite bourgeoisie through funneling dividends to shopkeepers, benefiting the state's most favored demographic. Are they changing cooperative ownership law? Okay, we'll see how that shakes out. The journal entry, uh, formerly known as the Path to Fascism, has been completely reworked. They've made fascism great again, now mirroring the specter haunting the world journal entry. If the growth of fascist movement cannot be contained, they will launch a march on your capital. Uh, oof. Possibly seizing power in the same way that Mussolini did in 1922. Okay. And now we also have the London Conference. That's right, we're not done yet. This dev diary keeps going and going, and we're supposed to start in 15 minutes, so I guess we're not eating breakfast. Um, the London Conference, um, we'll do... I think this is... Well, we're, we'll read about it. The modern borders of Belgium and the Netherlands were once settled upon in uh, 1839 through a process which involved every great European power. The historical result of the London Conference uh, was the Treaty of London in 39, which is a document that provided independence and neutrality of Belgium here. So we see there, that's Belgium. Uh, the London Conference Journal entry will appear for European great powers uh, in 38 to 39 and will permit each power to vote upon a desired uh, settlement between the Netherlands and the newly independent Belgium. This conference can have various outcomes depending on how the great powers vote. Well, uh, giving yourself an ability like as France to vote for uh, like an ability to take a piece of Wallonia is really good for the sake of the company. There's more free content. Okay. 
Thank God, we've reached an end. Uh, there's more free content in 1.8, but I unfortunately have exhausted the limit of in images one can fit in a single forum post. That's true. The remainder awaits its discovery once the update is released. Okay, and that is all. Thank you for reading. Next week, Kenneth will cover the 2D art for Pivot of Empire, unless they do a surprise Saturday dev diary, which they don't because they don't work on Saturdays. But this has been a very long dev diary. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We have a ton of changes coming in, just absolutely monstrous changes in a bunch of different spots, um, mainly related to India. Um, but I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe. If you're watching this the day this is released, we will be streaming all day. Um, uh, you know, do the YouTube algorithm thing, also, etc. Mostly, etc. Uh, but other than all that, have a happy Friday slash triple happy weekday week. Uh, because that's what we've achieved this week. Uh, for Not just for Victoria, but for all of mankind.